This morning's scripture is from Luke chapter 23, verses 44 through 49. Now it was about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. Then the sun was darkened, and the veil of the temple was torn in two. And when Jesus had cried out with a loud voice, he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. So when the centurion saw what had happened, he glorified God, saying, Certainly, this was a, man, this was a righteous man. And the whole crowd who came together at that sight, seeing what had been done, beat their breasts and returned. But all of his acquaintances and the women who had followed him from Galilee stood at a distance watching these things. All right, good morning. Good morning. Thank you. It's good to be with you this morning. Uh, I always mean that when I say that. It's a beautiful morning, and you guys help make it so beautiful. Um, I want to get into this, but lots I want to tell you first. Always just uh, a lot of good things to share. And so um, um, we've got some things coming up that I've kind of waited uh, to talk about from our pulpit, but I need to talk about. And so a lot of good opportunities for our kids. Make sure you got a bulletin. Check those opportunities out. Uh, one thing specifically I've not said publicly is that on October the 14th, and this is not so much for the kids unless the kids aren't in school that day, but uh, this is primarily for those of us who, who have that day off, maybe our retired family here or uh, folks that would like to get in the bus and go enjoy lunch at the Bell Buckle Cafe. And so on October the 14th, I'll be driving the bus. Don't let that scare you. Um, but we'll go to Bell Buckle and enjoy a day together eating lunch and then kind of some of the, the shops around the area. That's October the 14th. There's a sign-up sheet in the foyer. If you want to go, go. It'll be fun. Uh, we are wearing the tires out on that bus, literally wearing the tires out. We, uh, we had them replaced not too long ago. And so there are people here today that are here because of a bus ministry. Isn't that cool? Like bus ministry was something that was rekindled um, uh, here uh, through COVID and after COVID. And man, what a blessing that has been. Very thankful for that. Also wanted to say this publicly. This Tuesday night is our last softball game of the season. It's a tournament night. And so uh, we've been having a great time. The support from Old Union has been awesome. I mean, literally. Um, you guys, so, so many have been there to support the softball team on Tuesday nights. It's almost made us feel bad for the other teams sometimes because there's, they don't have as many as we do. And so, but we cheer on everybody and have a great time. Um, we have grown as a team. I mean, I know that sounds kind of funny to say it's just softball, right? But no, really, like relationships have grown. We've had opportunities to, to chill and not get crazy, you know, uh, playing softball. Um, we've prayed after every game with those from the other teams who have wanted to join in. Uh, prayer requests have been given. We've, we've grown relationships, and so we wanted that to be a God-glorifying thing, and I think it has, but this Tuesday night's it, and it's a tournament, so if you want to come and uh, enjoy that with us, it'll start at 7. Um, let's pray. Uh, pray with me, and uh, then we'll, we'll, we'll dig in. Uh, Father, I'm thankful for this congregation. Um, many here know that uh, it's not always been what we thought. It certainly hasn't been easy. Uh, there's been challenges. There's been changes. Uh, there's been things that have been hurtful and upsetting um, Father, there's also just been things that are just so good and so wonderful. And, um, Father, we are thankful um, for everything that comes our way, and we are blessed to be able to embrace these things through faith and through trust. And, um, and Father, um, we just pray that your will be done. I'm thankful to look out and, and see faces that even I don't know very well, visitors. and I'm thankful to look out and see faces that I've known for a long time, um, friends and family. And so, Father, just continue to bless us. Um, 
we trust you, we love you, and, and I think I can lead us in prayer and say that, Father, we want your way here at Old Union. Uh, thank you for this wonderful book, this inspired text that, that we get to explore and dive into week after week. And I pray today um, that our hearts are softened and that our eyes are open, perhaps like they've not been before, um, to be beneath the cross of Jesus. Uh, we love you. We praise you. He is our Savior. And it's through him we pray. Amen. Uh, thank you guys so much. Uh, there's a lot that goes into Sunday, a lot that you'll never see, a lot that we don't typically talk about. Um, thankful for the people that lead us. I always feel like I want to say that. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I did not know that there was another living by faith. We found out this morning that apparently there's another living by faith, right? And so sometimes we put songs up here just thinking, or I do, and there's no we. I, uh, I put the songs up here and I think, oh yeah, living by faith is living by faith. I was really pumped to sing that third verse with you. And so... Uh, Philip has become a good friend of mine, um, and, uh, and so, sorry about that, brother, but uh, you did a good job. Living by faith, uh, that one is one we know, and I like to close my eyes and just sing that. It's more of like a, I like to remind myself that I'm living by faith, that it doesn't always make sense. It's certainly not always easy, but I am living by faith. That, that third one, though, beneath the cross of Jesus, you know, that's one that uh, I'm less familiar with. You want to open up your songbooks? I do this a lot here for those of you who are visiting. And so I'm convinced that, um, I'm convinced that the, the, the singing worship of the early church was probably more of them singing the psalms, the literal psalms that, are in the old, that we find in the Old Testament. And so what's probably taking place is that they know these words so much by heart, they've recited them from their youth. And so they're able to sing them um, in ways that they don't have to just think about the words constantly because they know them. And there's a lot more to say about that. Obviously, you know, it could become rote memory and they could be complacent. But, but, but this is what I'm trying to say. If you really know a song and, and, and you sing it, then, then oftentimes you can really, like, let it move you. You can really pay attention to what it means. And so the other end of that is sometimes we don't know songs, and maybe we're just trying to not sound bad. <laughs> and so we're trying to sing, but we're not really paying attention to the words. Um, there's some really good ones in this one, or really good words in this song, song Beneath the Cross of Jesus. Um, beneath the cross of Jesus, I feign, a word that means gladly, I will gladly take my stand. Um, the shadow of a mighty rock within a weary land, a home within the wilderness, a rest upon the way, from the burning of the noontide heat and the burden of the day. O oh, safe and happy shelter, O oh, refuge tried and sweet, O oh, trysting place, uh, thankfully the note at the bottom says meeting, okay? A meeting place where heaven's love and heaven's justice meet. Isn't that cool? That cross, the place where love and justice meet. As to the holy patriarch, that wondrous dream was given. I think that's a reference to Abraham. Abraham was given this, this promised covenant that God would never forsake him and would always bless him. Okay? So it's kind of neat to pull from that. As to the holy patriarch, this wondrous dream was given. So seems my Savior's cross to me, a ladder up to heaven. Isn't that cool? I won't keep reading that. I mean, I mean, three and four are awesome as well. You can read that if you'd like. But again, sometimes it's just too easy for us to try to not sound bad and to miss over some pretty awesome words. Uh, this morning, our Savior will die. Not literally, obviously. He's, he has already died and resurrected. But this morning, we're in the portion of the text where Jesus whom we love, amen, is going to die. And so this is a hard text. It's a hard one for me. I have just given in that I'll not do it justice. Um, there's so much going on here. There's so much symbolism going on here that I, I will spend my life studying it and will probably never feel ready to just talk about all the wonder and the love that is displayed here. But yeah, we're at the point of the text where the text reads, He breathed His last. Again, a very dramatic way of saying that He died. Jesus 
will die. Um, I think about those who are watching this. I think about them a lot. I think they're a big part of the story. And so for many of them, it's probably not their first crucifixion. Okay? Um, Many of them had probably seen others tortured and hanged and mocked. And so, you know, I can only speculate, but for some of them, it had probably become somewhat commonplace. You may be here this morning, and this be so common to you. It's just what you do on Sunday, you know? Um... I suggest that you really attempt to not make our gatherings common. That's kind of a side note, I guess, but perhaps some of them, this was just a normal occasion. Oh yeah, somebody's being crucified today. The soldiers, the centurions, um, again, I'm sure it wasn't their first. I'm sure they were skilled executioners. The text seems to indicate that they might have been bored, maybe even playing games, you know, over on the side just making sure no, no riot broke out. Uh, perhaps they had worked, think about that, maybe they had worked hundreds of crucifixions. So maybe they just wanted to end so they can go home, right? Let's break his legs and get out of here again. But something was different about that day. At least the text indicates that something was different. And, and, and that was where I chose to focus this week. What was so different about this crucifixion? Okay, I'm a believer. That's not always easy. Um, I hope that doesn't make you terribly uncomfortable for me to say as your preacher that it's not always easy for me to live by faith. But it's not. And so sometimes even I read these texts and I think, really? Like, really? Really? But you know what? I want to be all in with this one. Oh, I do, and I want to invite you to be all in with it with me, because I think this is the whole point. This is the end of the lesson. Nobody left from this day, this event, unchanged. Nobody. Nobody walked away from this one thinking that was just casual, just another crucifixion. Nobody. Okay? And so what made this one so different? Well, for starters, Luke tells us that darkness descended on the land. That's a pretty big deal, right? Yeah. So, so Matthew and Mark both indicate this. John doesn't directly, but again, Matthew and Mark confirm that darkness descended upon the land. And the text indicates that the darkness was significant, that it wasn't just a cloud that came over the sun all of a sudden, that there was significant darkness. The sun was obscured, the New American Standard, in my, uh, 95 reads. Your translation may be, read something different. Okay? Again, so significant darkness for three hours, three hours of significant darkness over the whole land, the text reads. And so this is kind of a big deal. Um, I'm very much aware of attempts. In fact, I often do this. It's like my mind wants to jump to science and separate science from God all the time. And that's a challenge for me. I try not to do that so often. But I'm very aware of attempts to make this just, just a natural thing that might have happened that was somewhat common. Again, maybe the the clouds just covered the sun for a little while. Or, you know, uh, recently we've experienced an incredible natural phenomenon where the sun was darkened. Do you recall this? Wasn't that awesome? Yeah. So we, we, drove, we, we were in Knoxville at the time, around Knoxville area. We drove all the way back here because we wanted to be in the path of totality. I was not going to miss totality. So we drove all the way back here, and that was unforgettable. Utterly unforgettable. And so... Anyway, we might just be very quick to think, well, this was something that was unusual, but, was, but is easily to explain through natural phenomenon. Um, but I'll suggest to you that it was not that. The text indicates that this was something that God was intentionally and directfully and directly and powerfully doing. That's what the text indicates. Okay? And, 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 and so it's really good for me to to look back at all the places in the Scripture that, again, I believe that I have faith in, even though I struggle sometimes. It's really good for me to look back in all the places of Scripture that indicate that God does have the power over nature. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Um, I looked in the Psalms a lot this week. In in fact, just spent a lot of time in the Psalms and in the places. Uh, Go to Psalm 33. This was one that stuck out to me. I put a Job reference on the screen. But Psalm 33 was pretty cool. Psalm 
So Psalm 33, around verse 6. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. And by the breath of His mouth, all their hosts. I need that. I need that. I need that faith. I need that. So by the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. And by the breath of His mouth, all their hosts. He gathers the waters of the sea together as a heap. And He lays up the deeps in storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of Him. This is verse 9 of Psalm 33. For He spoke and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. Isn't that cool? The Lord nullifies. I, I, I love 10. I want to keep reading. So then the Lord nullifies the counsel of the nations. Okay, remember, it's our God who has control of nature. And so then he, he is greater than the counsel of the nations, I think, is the idea there. He frustrates the plans of the people, right? How often have we been frustrated by the weather, you farmers and builders and folks out there? The counsel of the Lord stands forever. The plans of his heart from generation to generation unending there. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people whom he has chosen for his inheritance. Look, church, I don't, I don't always get it. I don't always understand it. Again, my, my scientific mind often battles it, but I have so enjoyed not separating the two, the science of the earth from the God of creation. And I found a lot of strength this week thinking about words such as Job's words when he was struggling who was reminded of God and spoke this, it is God who removes mountains. And it is God who shakes the earth. And it is He who commands the sun. Think about that when you see these beautiful sunrises that we're getting in Castine Springs right now. It is God who stretches out the heavens. It is God who does great things and fathomable things and wondrous things without number. That was good for me. I hope it's good for you. And so instead of just trying to just you know, ah, well, I guess the sun was darkened in some way that I can understand. No, maybe this was different. Maybe this was different. Okay? And then it's really good for me to remember that the whole story of the Bible is one of a creator. Uh, one who said, let there be light. Light that, that overwhelms the darkness and that commands the chaos. And there was light, right? Right? And so I think about how this is too simple perhaps, but if he can turn the lights on, then surely he can turn them off, right? Something happened that day. Something happened that day. And this must have been a most unusual characteristic of Jesus' crucifixion. I, I wanted to say this. Something that I probably can't explain happened that day. That's part of my faith. And it must have been a most unusual characteristic of Jesus' crucifixion. I'll never forget the eclipse. They must have never forgotten this day. The text reads, from the sixth hour, which is about noontime, okay, they measure their hours by the time the sun rises, so this is an indication of about the middle of the daylight time, okay, so around noontime, when the sun is supposed to be the brightest, right? During the sixth hour, there was darkness over the entire land until the ninth hour, so until around 3 p.m., because the sun was obscured. Again, my text reads. I don't like that. There's often times I don't like how the New American Standard uh, translate things. I like the translations that give direct reference to God there. And some of yours do. I think the King James says um, the, the sun was made dark or something to that effect. I like that. That's cool. Okay. The sun was darkened. NIV says the sun stopped shining. Wow. Let that be wonderful to you. Okay. Again, such language connects this to God's direct control. Something happened that day. So often in Scripture, we see, this is kind of the next point that I'd like to make. This is really cool. So often in Scripture, we see significant celestial events coincide with really important things that happen on earth. I need to say that one more time. So often in Scripture, we see God demanding, controlling significant celestial events that coincide with really important things that happen here on earth. And this is good for me too. And so, 
perhaps you know this. I won't talk about all that. Well, there's a lot to talk about there. That's, that's, a, that's coffee conversation. That's cool to talk about. But this event, I think, was really important to the gospel that you and I believe in. Okay? Let me, let me tell you why. And so it, Acts is really important to us. Right, church? We talk about Acts a lot. We talk about Acts 2 a whole lot. I think when Peter is preaching in Acts 2, I think that he is using prophecy to reference what happened this day on the cross. I think he is. I don't think this dark event at crucifixion is something that we just need to exclude and move away from. I think, and you challenge this if you'd like, please. I love you guys, by the way. Let me step, it is good for us to talk about Scripture together. It really is, okay? I've told you before, I don't have all this figured out, okay? And so think about this with me. You flip over to Acts 2. You can, you can do that now if you'd like. This is a text that we all love, that we often use as, as like a foundation for who we are as a people. And that's a good thing. I just think we need to use all of it. Okay? In Acts chapter 2, Peter is preaching something profound. Peter is going to... Is, God through Peter, the Spirit through Peter, is going to convict the hearts of some of these people who have put Jesus on that cross. And this is how he's going to do it. He's going to recall language from Joel, the prophet. Don't, don't, don't let me lose you, please, okay? Joel is a minor prophet. We don't talk about his prophecy a lot, but it's several hundred years before Jesus, okay? And, and, and Joel told us that some major celestial events would, would, would coincide with terrifying and wonderful world events, okay? Again, that's, that's the gist of it. We can talk about that a lot more. Most of the times we read Joel as apocalyptic. Stephen, just hush, move on. Listen to me. Joel is telling us that major celestial events will coincide with important things on earth. And look at what Peter does in Acts 2. Let me turn my Bible there. You guys beat me. I'll just begin in verse 20. This is, what he this is what he's telling the people there at Pentecost. He says, The sun will be darkened, the moon turned into blood, before the great and glorious day of the Lord shall come, and it shall be that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Isn't that cool? Now, we read that. If you're like me, you've read that, and you think that... Maybe that somehow probably means when Jesus returns, and, and, and I think it, it's, it's applicable for that too. But I just ask you to consider with me, how's, how's Peter using this right here? How's he using it? Well, let's read what he says next. He quotes Joel, and then he says, verse 22, Men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus, the Nazarene, a man tested to you by, attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs which God performed through him and in your midst, just as you yourselves know. This man, delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and you put him to death. What's Peter talking about? Peter's talking about the death of Jesus. And he'll go on to pierce their hearts by telling them that this man you put to death actually resurrected. And if you want to be right, there's something you need to do about that. We'll, we'll get to that later, okay? Why am I telling you any of this? Well, I think that's what Peter's doing. I think Peter's making a direct reference to the celestial event that took place when Jesus was crucified, but this is even more important. Or maybe, I guess, this is the point that I'm making. Stephen, what are you talking about? Why does this matter? Well, listen, you and I, think, think, think about this with me. And I'm assuming here, and uh, I shouldn't do that. I try not to do that. But a lot of y'all are like me. And a lot of y'all grew up like me. And a lot of y'all heard the same things that I heard growing up. And a lot of you spent a lot of time thinking about when Jesus is going to come back. And a lot of you spent a lot of time terrified by that. Again, if you're like me. Um, I used to have dreams. I've never confessed this. 
I used to have dreams of being terrified when I would hear those trumpets sound. I've spent a lot of time thinking about the return of Jesus in a way that, you know, I didn't, I was terrified. I was scared to death, Seth. I was scared to death. I've spent a lot of time thinking about that. Why? Because when Jesus comes back, I completely believe, I always have believed, that things are not going to be the same after that. And, 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 and there's an either or for me. And there's an either or for you. And dear God, I hope that I'm that good either or and not that bad either or. You know, like that's, that's the way I've spent a lot of time thinking. We need to talk about that. If that's you, let's please talk about that because I don't think you have to think like that. I don't think you do. I think you can, you can genuinely pray, Lord, come quickly and want him to come. I think you can. And I want to talk about that, but that's not this lesson this morning. This is the point I'm saying. We've spent a lot of time thinking about Jesus returning, and we know, we believe without question that things are going to be different. Amen? Something's going to be different. Well, let me tell you this. I think... As equally as something will be different when Jesus returns, things were different when he was crucified. Something happened that day. I don't think Peter's talking about just this, this ultimate change where the sun is darkened when Jesus returns. I'm telling you, something happened that day. That's what Christians believe. Something happened. They left different. They left changed. That's all I'm suggesting. It was an event like none other. It was utterly impossible for them to leave unchanged. This is what Luke is indicating. Look back at the text with me. Look at the people who were changed. I know I skipped a verse. I'll get back to it. 47. After Jesus had breathed his last. Now when the centurion, remember the people who this had probably become pretty casual for? The people who, 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 who might have... In, in some way just wanted to get their work done and crucify a guy. When the centurion saw what had happened, he began what? Praising God. Something was different, wasn't it? He said, certainly this man was innocent. The text that Scott read for us said, certainly this man was righteous. There was something about him. Look at verse 48. And all the crowds, I always tell you to pay attention to the alls in Scripture. Pay attention to the alls in Scripture. Luke writes, and all the crowds who came together for this spectacle, when they observed what had happened, what'd they do? They returned, I guess. They left the hill of Calvary, the skull, and they were beating their breasts. Whoops. They were beating their breasts. That's an interesting image, isn't it? The image of beating your breasts. Why do you do that? Why do we do that? Where does that come from? You ever thought of where that comes from? I don't know, like, this is things we can talk about, but it's neat to think about. Maybe it comes from your heart hurts so bad, you know? I don't know. Think about that with me. But I do know this, and so Luke has used this term at least twice in his gospel. I always like to do that. I always like to see, well, how's the writer using the term? Okay, the first time that I'm aware that Luke uses this term, it's when a little girl has died. I say that again, a little girl has died. I can't camp out on talking about children suffering or dying too long. You know this. It gets me every time. The first time Luke uses the beating of the breasts, it's because a little girl has died and people are mourning and lamenting her death. Jesus resurrects her, by the way. I don't want to end it there. But anyway, the second time that Luke uses this term, it's, uh, let's check into this. Everybody with me, let's check into this. It's because a guy has shown up to church, if you'll pardon the expression, and he doesn't feel worthy to be here. He doesn't feel like he belongs. But he knows there's something about this God, and, and, and he knows that he wants a relationship with this God. So you know what the text indicates? He just stays in the back. He stays in the back, and he won't even lift up his head. And he beats his breast and he says, God, just be, do you know the language? Be merciful to me. I'm a sinner. And so these are the times that Luke indicates the beating of the breast. And so now let's try to jump back in to where we are in the text. The people, they saw something was different. All right, man, it's dark. Like centurions over here praising God. They know something's up. 
And so what? They're, something's changed. They're, they're broken. They're sorrowful. Holy, you know, like, wait, wait a minute. Three hours ago, I was mocking him. Uh, three, three, three hours, you know, throughout this morning, I have been yelling. I have been encouraging this man's death. This happens. It, obviously, God is with this man. Oh, by the way, dog, like, he was saying, forgive us. Now, can you check into, you know, I don't know this. Again, there's a lot I don't know. Um, there's a lot I can only speculate, but the next day is Sabbath. And I have a feeling that that Sabbath was, a, was an unusually quiet Sabbath. Don't you think? Like, <clears throat> So the cross is different. This is different. It's what I keep coming back to. But the celestial events, that's cool to talk about. That's not even the biggest deal. There's this little line, I think, on the next slide in yellow. There's this little line that Luke just kind of tosses in there. You guys catch that? And the veil of the temple was torn in two. I, I think, I don't know, but I think that, that, that may be a pretty big deal. Yeah, I think Luke probably put that in there as something that would have definitely triggered his audience. The veil of the temple was torn in two. I, can't, I, I, I apologize to you. I apologize to leadership, to whoever I need to apologize to. I don't know how to do this. I don't know how to talk about all the wonder and the symbolism and the impact of this temple veil being torn. Uh, there, there are hours, days, years, lifetimes, perhaps, of study that could go into all the wonderful symbolism and what this means. So this is, this, is my, this is my brief, these are brief words to you trying to put all this together. If you're going to try to, to even consider what this means, you probably need to start back in Exodus, okay? So in Exodus 26, I, I think it's okay for us to read that. Exodus isn't too hard to find, right? It's an early book. It's not like finding Joel. And so... If you go to Exodus 26, around verse 31, you'll get a description of how the Israelites were to make and hang this veil. In the tabernacle, though, that's really important. This is a description of the veil in the tabernacle. All right, don't let me lose you. Real quick, remember, um, Moses, out of Egypt, leads God's people. They go to Mount Sinai. They're given a lot of instructions by God. And then they are told, do you, do you recall this? They are told to build this, this mobile dwelling place for God so that God can constantly be with them as they journey through the wilderness. That mobile dwelling place is called the tabernacle. And it's really cool. And there's a lot of awesome, incredible things that were constructed to be a part of that tabernacle. Okay? Well, one of them, it actually had a couple of tents, really. It had an outer tent and an inner tent. And that outer tent was what was important. Inside of that was the holy place. But inside of that inner tent was the holy of holies. That's the place where God himself was believed to rest on the mercy seat. That was quick, wasn't it? But that's it. Right? Like, ho hopefully we know a little bit about this. Okay? And so the Israelites were given specific instructions on how to build these curtains and prepare uh, for the service of God within the holy place and the most holy place. All right? And in Exodus 26, we get this description of a veil that was constructed. It reads, you shall make a veil of blue and purple and scarlet material. These are, these are valuable materials. And, and finely twisted linen. And it shall be made with cherubim. Okay, so, so, so like embroidered images of majestic beings embroidered on this veil. It's the work of a skillful craftsman, by the way. Isn't that cool? I won't read the rest. You can later, but, but, but you can read about how it was made to be hanged. All right? Hung up. But look here. And, and, th and this is so quick. Okay, you need to read Exodus. You need to read Leviticus. It's even, I shouldn't say cooler, but it's also really cool to study the Jewish traditions regarding this veil. Really cool. Okay? This is one thing I found. This is the thing that has stuck with me the most. Jewish scholars, rabbinical teachings suggest that this thing in the time of Jesus 
was massive. That's the thing that stuck with me the most. It was massive. You see this? I've often thought of it kind of like this. It's a little veil that separated two places in a big tent. I've, for some reason, you know, I study a lot in the fellowship hall. I like that room, the sun shines in it. I found myself thinking it's like the curtains that hang in the fellowship hall. Those are kind of nice, by the way. You know what? But scholars suggest this thing might have been as much as four inches thick. That's a big old veil, isn't it? Some suggest that it was anywhere between 30 and 40 feet tall. I meant to ask you how, just estimate how tall this room is. I don't know. 25? Who knows? Like huge, guys, huge veil skillfully constructed. Who knows how much it weighed? You could probably find that in a Jewish tradition somewhere. Big, big thing, right? About, you're thinking, wait a minute, Stephen. Like, but, but, but Exodus didn't talk about it that way. Remember, we're not talking about the tabernacle veil. We're talking about the temple veil. Solomon constructed a temple. It was destroyed, rebuilt during Ezra and Nehemiah. And then Herod, Herod the Great, ornately reconstructed it before Jesus. Jesus exists at a time when this temple is an, is an you, you can't miss it. This structure cannot be missed in Jerusalem. It's this huge building. And within that temple complex is this veil that separates the holy place from the most holy place. And it's enormous. Some of that was new to me. I hope it's new and meaningful to you. And when Jesus breathed his last, what happened? It tore. It tore from top to bottom. That's, that's interesting. I was visiting somebody. I haven't told this story either. I was visiting a college campus not too long ago. And I'm sitting there in a, in a, in a seat. And I'm waiting. Um, and, and there's these girls sitting next to me. And they're studying a scripture on a college campus. Isn't that cool? State school, by the way. And I heard one of them say this. This was neat. I heard one of them say, do you think maybe that tent tore from top to bottom to symbolize that it was God's work being done here from top down? I thought, I, I wanted to like lean in even more. They were teaching me. That's so cool. I've never thought of that. Maybe that's common for you. Like, I don't know. But I think it's probably significant that it ripped from the top to the bottom. This massive curtain, okay? And so we've talked that up. You can study that so much and see all these cool, like, real or cartoon. Like, you can see all kinds of images of this. They're just numerous. But what's the point? Like, what's all this mean? Why, why was the temple veil torn in two? I thought a lot about the chief priests and the high priest who was... Who would, who would have seen that? Like, when that temple veil torn, what were they thinking? When it tore, what were they thinking? Were they thinking, like, why are we still alive? <laughs> like, for, for years after years after years, we have very delicately and purposefully followed the instructions of God. And on the Day of Atonement, that's the only day we have, we have done everything right to try to get behind that veil and hopefully not make a mistake and die and then all of a sudden the veil's torn, and, and, and oh, and by the way, like the access to the most holy place is open to all. Can I say that again? Wait a minute. Access to the most holy place is open to all. Wait a minute, right? Access, presence, here. Open to all. Church, that's what we can write books about it. Talk about it so much, but that's as simply as I can put it. When Jesus died, what? Access to the presence of God is now available to all. And get this, it's not about you're doing every single thing right so you can get into his holy presence. Flip it. Completely flip it. It's about the one 
who did every single thing perfect. And guess what that means for us? You and I get to access that most holy place with God. I'm going to say this, and this is upsetting for some, but i got to say it because I believe it's true. But I better say it like I wrote it or I'll be in trouble. All right? Might be in trouble anyway. The old covenant involves service that led to rightness with God. That word means atonement, okay? The old covenant involves service that led to atonement. The new covenant. You ready? This is the gospel. The new covenant involves atonement through Jesus that then leads to our service. Read Hebrews, and you'll see um, the Lord led me to Hebrews this week, how blessed I was. Uh, so many places I could go. The veil is mentioned at least three times in Hebrews. Um, can I just read for you? Is that okay? I don't do this often. Go to Hebrews 9 with me real quick, and we'll let the kids come in here. This is hard, but, but I'm, I'm not here. I, I don't even think anymore that it, it's, it's more than a sermon, Stephen. You're not going to move the people with a sermon. Let God move them with his spirit and be patient with that. Be patient with that. Hebrews 9. Um, now, even the first covenant had regulations of divine worship and earthly sanctuary. Oh, it had all kinds of regulations for that. And then, and then the writer goes on to explain, uh, for there was a tabernacle prepared, a tent prepared. Let's talk about the outer one first, though. The outer one in which were the lampstand and the table and the sacred bread, that's called the holy place, okay? But behind that second veil, there was another tent, which is called the holy place. Of holies, And in it was a golden altar of incense and the Ark of the Covenant that was covered with gold, in which was the golden jar holding manna and Aaron's rod which budded and the tables of the covenant. And above it were cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat. But of these things we cannot now speak in detail. And see, most people believe that, that, that the emblems behind in, um, in that holy place were not present during the time of Jesus. They had been taken, stolen, Babylon captivity. There's all kinds of theories there. Won't get into that. But, but again, this writer is recalling the magnificent holiness that was behind that second veil. Let me keep reading, okay? Now, when these things have been so prepared, the priests are continually, underline that word, continually, entering the outer tabernacle, performing the divine service. But into the second, only the high priest enters once a year. And not without taking blood, which he offers for himself and the sins of the people committed in ignorance. I love verse 8. There is so much going on in verse 8. This is what the Holy Spirit is signifying that the way into the holy place has not yet been disclosed. You can't get in to the holy place while that outer tabernacle is still standing. There has to be some, some connection into this holy place, okay? And this is the symbol of the present time. Oh, I love this. Accordingly, both gifts and sacrifices are offered which cannot make the worshiper perfect in conscience since they relate only to food and drink and various washings and regulations for the body imposed until a time of reformation. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things to come, he entered through the greater and more 
perfect tabernacle, the one not made with hands, that is to say, not of this creation, and not through the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood. He entered the holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. If the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling those who have been defiled sanctify for the cleansing of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Church, this is the gospel. It's what that veil symbolizes. Jesus Christ, through, through, the, through the veil of his body, of his life, of his flesh, he died and shed his blood. Jesus Christ entered behind the veil of creation to where God exists and proclaims on our behalf this freedom from our guilt, this freedom from our sin. The rest of the book is about this amazing hope that we now live in every day because we have such a Savior. Can I say it one more time? The Old Covenant involved this constant and continuous service that led to an atonement that was in no way even perfect or lasting. The new covenant involves an atonement through Jesus, a freedom through Jesus that leads to this life that is compelled in service to God. And that's the gospel. We're going to invite you to follow it. I think our kids are ready. If not, we'll just be singing anyway until they are. Let's sing, and then you'll have the opportunity to respond to this. <clears throat> the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. <clears throat> Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me and cast me not away from your presence O Lord and take not your Holy Spirit from me restore unto me the joy of my salvation and renew a right spirit within me you know what like so, so we, again, we attribute Psalm 51 that we just sang. Is that Psalm 51 that we just sang? We attribute that to David. And I've never thought about this until now, which has got to be careful when I say it, when I think about this. But you know how David was singing that song? David was singing that song pleading that God's spirit not be taken from him. You know, he was singing that th song through a Jewish religion, wasn't he? through a religion of regulation, through a religion of rule, through, through a, a religion of priests and high priests constantly, daily, and then yearly through the Day of Atonement, having to make right their sin and their guilt. So see, we get to sing that song differently. Isn't that cool? We get to sing as people who are made new by the Spirit of God, who are compelled by this veil that was torn to live each day dead to our old self and alive to this new way. That's really cool. And I think the same thing's going on in, uh, in, in what Jesus quotes on the cross, or at least the line that Luke records Jesus quoting. Okay, so Jesus is on the cross, <clears throat> and he says this, you know this, Father, into uh, your hands I commit my spirit. That's what Luke records. Okay, and so, and so this is way too much that I need to do way too quickly, and I don't like it. And you guys know I don't like to be quick, but hey. Jesus is quoting Psalm 33, a psalm that David composed. And as David writes 
and sings and says this psalm, he is pleading to God for his life to not be over, for his life to not end, for his enemies to not kill him. That's what David's pleading. I trust you, God. I know you'll save me, God. Well, now let's think about how Jesus was using it, though. Guys, Jesus is going to die. He is. David lived to be an old man. Jesus is going to die, younger than me. Yet he's still saying, Father, what? I trust you. This is going to kill me, but I trust you. I'm, I'm, I'm going to die, but I still trust you. I still commit my life to you. That, that, is, that is our faith. I, I want to just pause. I know it's past time. Like, look, I want to pause and just remind you, that's our faith. Guys, this ain't easy. It is not easy. It, it hurts, and it's hard, and it's challenging, but this is our faith, the faith that says, this might kill me, but I trust you. I'm going to follow you. I commit my life to you. Isn't that cool? You, you read the text and you see some different responses that day. The centurion believes. Others beat their breasts. But there's these awesome women. These awesome women. These, these women from Galilee and others as well who they just kind of back up. They don't run away. They just kind of back up. Because they loved that man, and they trusted that man. And it's, and it's kind of like, to me, it's kind of like they're saying, you know what, this isn't the end. I don't understand it. It doesn't make sense. I don't like it. But this isn't the end. So you know what they do? They go get spices to prepare a body. And they spend this quiet day in Sabbath, but as soon as that sun rises on Sunday, where are they? They're back at that tomb. You see that? Who, who are you going to be today? Let, let that serve as an invitation. Who are you going to be today? Are you going to be people that walk away and say, hey, yeah, 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 yeah. it's not the way I thought it'd be, I'm done. Are you going to those people who live by faith and say, hey, maybe this doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but I'm in. I'm in, and I'm serving the Lord, and I'm working for him, and I'm waiting until he returns, and I'm living by faith, glory and in that cross. That's an invitation. I don't care about that time. I used to say that a lot. I don't care about that time. You respond to it, and we'll celebrate your response. Whatever we need to do, we'll baptize you. We'll walk this faith with you. Walk it with us. Come walk it with us. That's the invitation. We'll sing for your encouragement.